Hello, and welcome to today's webinar sponsored by Sumo Logic. The title of today's presentation is, Is it odd to shift left? Building Elite DevSecOps Performers. And odd is an acronym for Observability Driven Development. My name is Jenna Sargent Barron, and I'm the news editor for SD Times. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that this webinar will be available on demand through the sdtimes.com website in about 24 hours. Now, moving on to today's webinar topic. As I mentioned before, we'll be talking about observability-driven development and how it can be combined with DevSecOps to maintain top-notch digital experiences for customers by shifting security and observability left. The goal is for you to leave today's webinar with knowledge of best practices and observability as code, how to prioritize your automation investments, and how you can begin shifting your team culture to enhance overall performance. Our speakers today include Colin Falwell, Field CTO of Observability at Sumo Logic, and Michael Riordan, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Sumo Logic. Now to get things started, I'll turn it over to you, Michael. Great, thank you so much, Jenna. So I know Colin and I are really excited about our conversation today around observability driven mm -hmm. development or ODD, uh, which is, uh, you know, as you can see in our title. Um, and we're gonna talk about um, specifically how organizations can build a culture of elite performance um, and how ODD can play a role in that uh, culture and strategy. So to start off, um, I think we just wanna set the scene with uh, a view of, of how times have changed, kind of um, what that's meant for different teams within your organization and how technology has kind of shifted our practices mm -hmm. and, and our mindset. So Colin, I don't know if you want to speak to that. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot has changed in, in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, we, we've gone from, you know, uh, once a year waterfall uh, to, or, you know, once every six month releases, massive releases to, you know, um, uh, a, a world where everything is loosely coupled. Um, the monolith is is being decomposed. As uh, we still carry around these box of doorknobs, but um, um, you know, the the rate of change and 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 how things are done today. Um, you know, change goes into an environment multiple times per day. Um, you know, the QA process dev used to flip it over to, you know, uh, QA and they would test everything and they would just validate everything and then it would go to production. Now that's really integrated into the dev process into the dev life cycle. We see more and more automation um, in the QA process um, as part of, you know, just the, the pull request um, uh, battery of tests going on and merge request, you know, to the state of where. Um, you know, today elite performing teams, you know, they have a deployable artifact every time they check something into the into the central repository. And um, we see this also in security. Um, you know, security used to be an afterthought, um, but it's it's becoming you know now DevSecOps. And and uh, the reason for this is that you know security can no longer be an afterthought. And and the same things that we talk about in terms of observable systems with regard to performance and business capability. Um, you know, we see that in security as well. This, the same need of, of observability, the logs, the metrics, traces, all those things, security needs, needs those. And, and we're seeing more and more of that security integrated as, and, as an automated uh, component of, of, the, of the pipeline as well. Um, and just in general, if you just look at across, you know, IT and what IT used to do, it used to be that this, you know, we just configured and maintain infrastructure. Um, and today it's, it's, it's more about, you know, uh, unifying and standardizing the, the pipelines and, and providing developer self-service um, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, you know, to development teams. And in fact, you know, you'll, you know, you know, complexity is increasing, um, you know, because of all of this change that we're going through, because of the, uh, 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 the acceleration of things. Um, the stack is becoming more complex. There's a lot more open source um, that, that organizations are using. In fact, I think the, the, the metrics finally out that you know, I think 100% of organizations are leveraging open source and, and, and you know, one or many, many ways. Um, and that change is accelerating because of this decomposition. And, and because of this open source uh, uh, investment or this, this you know, um, uh, utility of open source, we see an, an increase uh, in the attack surface from Kubernetes to supply chain attacks and, and open source uh, libraries. Um, and, and all of this is really pushing, you know, data uh, to the breaking point for many, many organizations. 
um, uh, in order to uh, observe everything that's going on uh, and, and especially observing things, I, I'd say, in the old way of doing things, which is to throw in agents, collect a bunch of data, aggregate all the logs, uh, collect a bunch of metrics. Um, you know, it's just it's more than most organization budgets can handle. And so there's this there's this real need for cost justification. There's this real need for optimizing the uh, telemetry pipelines um, in order to make sure that you know what you're collecting, what you're observing is providing relevance to the business. It's providing relevance to IT, to the financial teams. Um, and you know, this is a great slide, right? Uh, this question of survival. You see so many organizations now that are upstart, that are smaller than 5,000 employees, that are coming into the market, that are disrupting uh, finance. They're disrupting manufacturing. This, they're 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 disrupting larger organizations because they're born cloud native. Um, they're taking on things like um, you know uh, observability uh, driven development up front. They're 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 moving everything left. Um, and so for larger organizations that that are you know well established or that are trying to take market share. Um, it, it's almost a question of survival at this point for, for many organizations uh, to, to not face being disrupted, um, to, to be able to, to, to uh, grow in merger and acquisition and, and capitalize and, and take on market share. They have to do things fundamentally differently if they're going to survive and, and, and thrive. And that makes complete sense. And, um, you know, given the strange macroeconomic environment we're in and, and mm -hmm. kind of the pressures that all these different teams are facing and the burnout, um, it, it really sets the scene for kind of why, uh, why you should be thinking about ODD. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's define ODD. So what is observability driven development? Yeah. I mean, at its core, observability driven development is just a shift left of all the things that, that you need to think about as a developer, as a product manager, as a business, um, uh, as somebody in finance or, uh, somebody's, you know, that's responsible for business intelligence. So all the ops, I call it X ops now, right? It's DevOps, SecOps, FinOps, it's BI, it's data science, all your ML, your AI ops. Like if you can get around this idea, of what it means to, to build observable systems. What is an observable system? An observable system is something that you put into production, you put code into production, and the, co the code will give you the feedback, it, it, it will emit the necessary signals to infer the internal state of the system as being healthy or not healthy. Um, and, and it covers all of these different personas, right? So observability-driven development, kind of like test-driven development, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a feedback loop. It's, it's, a, it's a philosophy, if you will. Uh, it's not necessarily just a practice. It's more of a philosophy, I think, kind of like, uh, like site reliability engineering is kind of a philosophy. Um, but observability-driven development is this idea of let's think about what do we need to do to build observable systems? What, what do we need to curate in terms of key metrics, uh, custom metrics out of the application code? Uh, what are the signals that we need uh, in order to satisfy uh, the knowledge that our system is healthy, it's secure, it's reliable, um, and, um, and it's functioning uh, within the specification limits. And that's really, I think, the key term there is specification limits. In other words, um, when we build observable systems, we have to, to create a hypothesis that, hey, the system, the software is going to operate in this way. Um, and we're going to put specification limits, upper and lower limits around that. We're going to build a performance corridor and we're going to measure that performance corridor. We're going to measure that, that metric uh, or that piece of data that says uh, the system is inside the scope or inside the specification limits as, 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 uh, at, at to, the, to the level that we expect it to be. This is the basis for SLIs, SLOs. Uh, and reliability management, if, if you will, right? So uh, taking the needs of the practitioners, the stakeholders, the business, and, and making sure that we, we codify that into everything that we do from a, from a software development practice uh, so that when we roll new software, new features, new capabilities out into the market, uh, and we do it faster and faster and faster, we're able to close that feedback loop uh, as quickly as possible and provide the information that we need in real time. Um, yeah, and so you know why why do this? Um, the advantages of of doing observability driven development is that it's a forcing function for what I call capability of process. I didn't come up with this; it's actually 
goes all the way back to the industrial uh, automation era, right? So if you go to the Handbook of Industrial Automation, you're going to find this idea of, of CP, which is this ability to to uh, uh, measure uh, your effectiveness at at driving outcome. Um, it it gives you the ability to go, you know, straight from development to production. Because if you're if you're doing observability driven development, you want to put your code into production as quickly as possible. You want to test code in production. ODD gives you an avenue, a mechanism, a way of doing this, because it, this gives you compressed cycle times. It gives you better quality data. It exposes weak process. Uh, do you have item potency in in your data layer? Can you roll back transactions if you change the format of your of, of how you store data or you extend your data model and you roll a piece of code into production and you need to roll that code out. Uh, can you roll back and, and replay the transactions uh, in the older format, uh, for example, right? There's, there's all sorts of things that come into play, but if, you, if you're gonna stay competitive in today's market, you have to be going to production as quickly as possible. You can't afford to have code that gets written and developed and sits around in languages in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a repository somewhere or sits in a test environment or a lower environment for months and months and months, it's not generating value. Why write code if not for the reason of generating value? So if you're gonna generate value as quickly as possible and you're gonna innovate quickly in the market and you're gonna stay ahead of these upstarts, you're not gonna, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna sidestep you know, being disrupted, you have to move fast move fast you have to test in production test into production you're going to do all of these things observability driven development is that vehicle to do it so it sounds like a, uh, it sounds a bit like you're saying to change a bit how existing processes and and how the the ways the world work so do you want to speak to that a bit kind of like how does that work culturally what does that mean in terms of uh one's mindset how does one go about this yeah you know i think if you if you step back and you look at just the the world of like site reliability engineering and the evolution of SRE uh, in the space, um, it's all about reducing toil and churn. So it's all it's all about automating um, and eliminating um, you know uh, what I call the you know the the traps uh, within you know your process capability. If you're if you're going to look at your process capability and measure the process effectiveness. How how accurate are you? Be, how, how long does it take to go from point A to point B in a process? How long does it take me to get through something to into production? Uh, no matter what you're doing, the, the biggest barrier to achieving reliability and stability and process within IT, within business in general, is, is eliminating silos. It's eliminating ticket queues. It's eliminating the where you have to stop and wait and rely on another team if you're filing jira tickets or you're going to another team or you, you reach a point and well i can't go to production because i need this team to do this this team to do this this team to do this uh, every one of those gates every one of those ticket queues is a uh is a uh source of of uh of variability that you can't control so if you want to eliminate variability, you want to move fast, you have to take all of these things that you're doing within your development, within your operations. You have to be able to overlay security. You have to bring all of this into uh, the, the, the fold, if you will, of delivering or developing, ideating on, uh, exploring, delivering, and developing and, and shipping software, which means it's got to be as, as automated as possible, which means that you have to rely more on, on the CI uh, process, uh, to do a lot of this work up front early in the life cycle. And you see a lot of open source tools now that are that are really jumping into this space, especially within security. Uh, we've had it a long time for, you know, all of the things that we do within development. You know, we're scanning software we're looking for. Um, uh, we're looking for, you know, outdated software. We're looking for, uh, uh, you know, anti-patterns in code. Like there's all sorts of tools out there, but we're seeing more and more in the security space start to move in as well. You've seen this also within, uh, you know, vendors like GitLab and others where, you know, they're really taking on this, this, this uh, challenge of, you know, providing safe and secure code, code scanning in the pipeline, doing this at CI uh, so that you don't have to worry about all of these things. It's not an afterthought. You're moving all of this into the automation frame of, of you know, what it means to, 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 to write, uh, deploy and, and ship software. 
No, this is great, right? Um, uh, I love this because it's like, you know, if you look about it like this objective by discipline, there's always been this dichotomy between DevOps and SecOps. DevOps is all about doing great things, getting on the news. Is my code running? How well is it running? SecOps is about staying out of the news. We don't want to be in the news. We don't want bad press. And should the code be running? <laughs> um, right. And and so, you know, between those two things, why are those two things important? Because you've got something that is 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 pushing the organization to move faster. Security is is all about mitigation of risk um, and, and trying to slow things down, because if you're going too fast, the, the risk profile increases. And then you have these two things. We talked about elite performers, the Dora metrics, right? DevOps Research Institute uh, talks about the Dora metrics, uh, which is, you know, your your lead time for change, your change failure rates. Um, uh, you're, you're talking about, you know, how long does it take to, to go from an idea to putting something into production? Um, and how was the success rate of that happening? And if there is a failure, how long does it take me to recover uh, from that failure um, and operate? And so those Dora metrics is all about compressing cycle times. It's increasing deployment frequency. It's reducing failure rates. It's lowering MTDR. Dora is 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 satisfying really the requirements on both sides of that DevOps and SecOps, but Dora metrics don't really do anything to talk about um, uh, or or really put emphasis on the need for for how observability is going to um, unlock those capabilities. And every mm -hmm. one of those things are capabilities, right? Uh, to compress cycle time, that's a business capability. And increasing deployment frequency, that's a, a capability. Those when we talk about capability of process. Those are capabilities we want to measure. We want to measure these things. So every capability we have, we should be measuring. O ODD gives us a way to, to feed that data, uh, to be able to build the, the process by which we measure those things. And so these are all very, I think, tightly complementary to one another um, uh, in terms of how we function within our development and engineering teams, all the way into you know, the product management and, and, and business portfolio management. Uh, our financial operations um, and and ODD really truly I think is the basis of all of that. So let's let's bring this to life I guess put a bow on it in terms of uh, the what constitutes an elite performing team like what do you see as sort of the defining characteristics of an elite performing team um, and and maybe you know speak to any real life examples if you can. Yeah, so elite performing teams are, are, are development engineering teams that can ship software. They can go from an idea or a hypothesis to putting code into production um, in less than 24 hours. Um, that's pretty that's pretty substantial, which means you're not spending a lot of time in UAT. Um, you're doing most of your testing um, in the pipeline, and whatever testing is not done in the pipeline is actually done inside of the production environment. You're getting that feedback. You're, you know, you're doing canary or ring deployments. You're, you're getting that instant feedback, and then you're, you're deciding to keep the code in or take it back out and continue to iterate on it and put it back in. Um, uh, and 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 it's also, uh, you know, that that less than a day for lead time. Then then once you have something, it you can get it into production in, in an hour. Um, and if there's a, a, a failure in that change, you can you can get it resolved in, 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 an, in under an hour. Um, which is which is pretty, which is pretty mature. I mean, you've got to have a lot of, of process capability to be able to, to to achieve the status of elite performer, and the number of organizations that, by the way, that that have elite performers are growing. I mean, it's up to like twenty six percent now from like eighteen four years ago. Um, oh yeah, there's that slide. But if you you know just step back one, right? Um, uh, you know, it does begin with transformational leadership. The Dora the uh, uh, the, the 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 Dora guide, if you will, or their their research paper that they've done has a lot of great content in it about you know what that transformational and culture really looks like. But you've got to invest in automation. You've got to in, uh, really embrace. I think um, going away from proprietary tooling and really embracing open source tooling because if you're going to build your own way of doing things, and all elite performing organizations are are very customized or I'd say tailored in the way that they do things. 
um, they're leveraging a lot of open source tooling because if you've got proprietary tools in there, most likely it's proprietary data format, it's proprietary backends. You're not going to build an observability practice with proprietary tooling that's going to keep you locked into one vendor. You want to be able to uh, continuously improve your observability. You want open source like open telemetry uh, to, to, to build that observability uh, you know, uh, foundation on. Um, and so you see a lot of em the em embrace of the open source to do this. Um, uh, and, and, you know, this makes it very easy, by the way, to shift everything left into observability, uh, into, you know, doing things as code. Um, you can take the open telemetry SDKs, you can wrap them, you can extend them, you can do all sorts of custom things that tie into your CI CD process uh, that give your developers easier access to annotate and do things um, you know, uh, in, in a, in a control plane fashion from a code perspective. So you can, you can put more of the production, uh, I would say production runtime and capability into the code base, along with the functional aspects of the code, um, and keep things very nicely annotated, very clean, um, and provides that the, the developer really the, the best of both worlds. Um, and, uh, and, and being able to interact with the CI pipeline where scanning takes place, where alarms, thresholds, alerts, and all the things that are needed in other parts of the business can be uh, output and curated into the pipeline very easily. Um, and again, that's all just done by simple annotation and code. So um, I think elite performing organizations, they, they get around this idea, they start doing a lot of this automation, um, and they've got, you know, buy-in at the top of the organization all the way down to, to really uh, fund uh, the investment in these sorts of um, uh, non-functional things, but, but that are, you know, really aligning the, the business and IT together. And like you mentioned, they're, they're on the rise. Yep, they're on the rise. Yeah, big time. Um, and that's, you know, that kind of goes back to that point. It's a matter of survival, right? Um, it really is a matter of survival to to uh, more established organizations that that uh, or industry that are out there because uh, you've most likely got an upstart, um, you know, uh, agile, cloud native, uh, elite performing development team, and and you know uh, if you're uh, if you're an investment, uh, you know, in, in investments and you're looking for VC, like, um, uh, or organizations that are looking to where to put their money or, or individuals looking to where to put the money, I'd be putting my money with elite performing organizations because they're going to accelerate. Uh, they're going to take market share. Uh, they're going to do things fundamentally better than, than their legacy counterparts. And let's speak to a real life, um, use case. I know you mentioned that there was one mm. boutique retailer that you thought really <clears throat> exemplified. Uh, an elite performing team. Yeah, I, I, I can't I can't use their name, but, but uh, they are out there. They've they they published a lot of um, uh, of content um, in in that um, you know they're they have they have really kind of documented their journey. But you know they're they're an engineering team um, uh, of about uh, two hundred engineers or so. Uh, they're in retail. Um, this uh, last year uh, during Black Friday and Cyber Monday and all of that, they never. They don't have any production freeze. They don't even have that notion anymore because production is their test environment, um, and and they're not a small they're not a small shop. I mean, they're boutique, but they're, they're they produce a lot of volume, um, and um, you know they're free to pr push code to production at any time. Um, there are there are gates that will stop something from going out. Uh, that has to do with the SRE team. So their SLIs or SLOs, like if their service level objectives are below a threshold. Um, it'll actually stop, you know, new change from going in and they'll actually, you know, like somebody broke the build in production uh, or in the pipeline, if the, if the build is broken and the pipeline can't build anything because something in the pipeline is broke, everybody stops and goes and works on that until it's fixed. And then they go back to doing what they're doing. It's that same mentality, but with the production environment, um, based on SLIs and SLOs, um, they mock. Uh, so if, ever, if somebody writes a service, they write a mock for that service. That mock represents the service, uh, you know, as it's going to be in production. Uh, so other teams that are testing against that service, if they're going to consume that service downstream, they don't necessarily need a test environment to do that. They can do that with a mock. So if I'm writing a service that's going to consume your service, you give me a mock, I'm going to pretend to use your service with that mock. Uh, and what's great about that is taking that to the API layer that gives me the capability. I don't have to go do anything. I can test my code in isolation uh, representing your code uh, or, or consuming your code with the mock 
Um, and I can do a lot more testing on my laptop. I can do it in the, in the, in the, um, uh, in the pipeline. Uh, I can break test my code in the pipeline without needing your system to be up in production. So I can get a lot of that early validation as I'm going through and doing things, making sure that I've got my SLIs and SLOs codified correctly, those sorts of things before I ever put my code into production. Uh, so that was a, something I thought that was really neat. And th so they do all of that automated performance test in their pipeline. Uh, they'll break test things over and over and over just to see, you know, let's let's make out the variability and let's get to the the, the real strong signals uh, that we see in the metrics and the, in the data so that um, when we go to production, this is how we think it's going to operate in production. And now we're just validating that through the ODD process. Um, and they do things like uh, completely just destroy and rebuild their clusters on a weekly basis, not because they have to but because it keeps them honest. This goes back to the capability of process. Very, very, very important is that, you know, if you've got brittle uh, systems in your environment, that's they're brittle because you're not touching them. It's maybe you've lost the, the you know, the, the people who knew anything about those systems or knew anything about that code and people just try to avoid it and stay away from it. Those are the things that you should be looking for uh, if you want to be an elite performer. You should have nothing in your environment that's brittle. You should be able to, to to have a deployable state at any point in time, straight from an artifact in your repository uh, that was that was built on the last uh, you know uh, uh, pull request, for example, or, or or commit, I should say, and 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 you know you've got robust analysis logs. You know logging is so important, um, but having the right data in the logs, um, curating the logs, having structured logging, um, putting you know being explicit about what you put into your logs. Um, having metrics that are emitting that are specific to the, you know, tell, telling the performance of the system um, uh, and, and how that system is operating. Because those metrics that come out might be used by another team to decide when to auto scale, um, uh, you know, their, their infrastructure and all the downstream infrastructure. So having logs, the metrics, the tracing. Uh, to be able to look at, you know, that kind of exotic uh, issues that might exist across, you know, a transaction, having all of this data tagged to the feature level. That's really key. That's one of the things that really enabled this team uh, or these teams to, 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 to go straight to production is that every time they put code into production, the data that gets emitted back is about that that piece of code. It's, mm -hmm. it's about the feature. Uh, it's about what went in um, and, and they're curating that information out and, and having a robust system for being able to do the log analytics and the aggregation and, and, and trace uh, to the feature level to, to see the metrics at that feature level, whether it might be revenue metrics or, or something else, um, you know, taking that approach, putting that into to practice, making it uh, a skill that your development organization has, um, uh, uh, and, and having a common unified standard way of doing that across the organization means you've got, you know, a common, uh, telemetry pipeline. You might have a thousand different pipelines pushing code into production, but you have one way of shipping code and one way of curating that telemetry out. Um, and, and that really frees up all, uh, all of the possibilities when it really comes to things like, um, you know, your, your innovation and ability to reduce risk and move fast. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Um, thanks, Colin. I think that concludes kind of our uh, upfront presentation, our prepared content. But I do think we have a couple uh, questions we want to run through. Okay. So I can tee them up for you. Sure. Uh, so we've spoken a lot today about uh, ODD, observ mm -hmm. Observability Driven Development. Uh, but we've not talked a lot about you know the company we work for, uh, Sumo Logic. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you mentioned logging is kind of very top of mind, such a mm -hmm. critical piece uh, of the puzzle. Can you speak a bit more about um, you know, why Sumo is uh, great at log management, log analytics, and sort of the other uh, observability capabilities uh, we offer? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we started in logging. Um, it, you know, it's really hard to, to, to make something in the cloud that will scale, um, uh, you know, that's truly multi-tenant SaaS, which is something that, that you know, I think we, we've done in spades and, and done probably better than anybody else. Uh, which is 100% cloud native log analytics platform, um, which means it makes it very easy to get logs in from anything, uh, from APIs, from other systems, from other clouds, from your systems, um, uh, through open telemetry, uh, through native collection. You know, uh, there's there's a million ways, even you know, with uh, like uh, things like uh, uh, Kinesis or or Kafka, you can get data in. 
the point is, is that, um, you know, uh, log analytics is hard and being able to, uh, being able to have, you know, robust machine learning and, and, and analytics that can, uh, you know, in the pipeline can, can parse uh, on demand, uh, schema on demand. You don't have to, you know, do grok rules or anything. You just shove data in and it's going to identify the variables, the things that are changing within the logs messages, things that are the common, things that are different. Um, and, and that brings a lot of power to the platform to take, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, voluminous log data and crunch and reduce it down to just the things that are changing. Uh, or the things that are new or the things that are different, something that we call log compare, log reduce. Um, uh, and that's built into the platform, uh, which is a great capability. And then, you know, we've also got all of the, uh, you know, modern observability capabilities as well. So, and security. So we have, uh, you know, one platform for, for, you know, robust log analytics. We have all the security analytics. We have Cloud Seam. We have a Cloud Soar product. Uh, so security analytics, analysis, being able to bring all of this in and manage, you know, everything from a from a from a security perspective, from a from a development and operations perspective, but then also to be able to lay over, you know, the things like the business and the custom metrics, and to to be able to curate all of this data uh, in a in a format that's open standards, that's that's uh, that's built around, uh, you know, a, a, a common entity model. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and makes it very, very easy for, for any organization, any persona and organization to come in and get uh, insight out of the platform. Great. Um, and then another question we got is around feedback. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm sure feedback is a critical component uh, to the, the, the way you kind of build an elite performing team and culture. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you, how would you say elite performing teams uh, deliver feedback to their engineers? Kind of what are some best practices around feedback? No, you know, I, I see a lot of, this is really where I think I see elite performing organizations that I've interviewed and talked to. This is really where they, they break away. I mean, they, they're leveraging all of the interfaces and the tooling and the capabilities of, of the CI tools, but they're, they're going a step further. They're, they're, you know, they're extending uh, and building their own CLIs to leverage for automation within the CI process, um, they're building a you know a comms framework within the CI/CD tool chain uh, that uh, you know provides a more curated list of information or targeted information, and they're leveraging that with Slack, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they're pulling data out of uh, you know our customers are pulling data directly out of Sumo Logic. They're merging that with the CI. We're bringing the logs from CI into Sumo, and we're leveraging uh, Sumo's capabilities for you know, tapping into things like uh, Slack um, and, and being able to, to go straight to, you know, we, we, this, this boutique, they, they annotate the code uh, so that the code owner is actually expressed in the code. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, and code ownership and, and the responsible person, whoever's going to be, you know, what team's responsible for what aspects of the services and systems when there's an issue, the, the pipeline will tell, hey, on, on the check-in of that code, everything was good or, hey, it wasn't good. Uh, we're going to notify everybody that's that's responsible for that, you know, PR. If you've got a big merge that's taking place that's going into production and something happens, all the owners of all the pull requests or all the commits, rather, uh, that went into that merge uh, all get notification and status update. They get notified just one time. Uh, they can also get notified when things are healthy again um, uh, and green. And so, um, you know, building that feedback loop really just comes down to what is the relevant information that you need at what point in time do you need it? Um, and, and, and how often do you need that information? And, and really being able to, I think, you know, uh, reach out and speak to the, the, the development organizations team and get consensus on that is important. But most importantly is is just building the feedback loops it's it's making sure that you've got the acquisition of the necessary telemetry and the application of that acquired telemetry to the personas that need it when they know it uh, when they need it and 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 having a, a way to fund the effort of doing that within the organization paying attention to that is is very 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 critical I think if you're going to be an elite performing team great um and then we have another question about open standards. I know you mentioned OTEL, open mm -hmm. telemetry in this mm -hmm. presentation. Can you speak a bit more around kind of why open standards or sort of what the role open standards plays in your ODD strategy uh, yeah. a bit more? Yeah, sure. Uh, be happy to. Um, yeah, I mean, it really comes down to this. Like, um, 
if you're going to get around doing observable, if you're going to build observable systems, why would you build an observable system with a agent that you licensed from a vendor uh, that's proprietary, that's closed? Um, why would you do that? Because if if ever you go sideways with that vendor in the future, or you decide that there's a better backend that you'd use, like to use, um, you would have to basically take that agent out, and you would basically have to start over from scratch. Um, and and open standards like Open Telemetry give you the capability to embed the SDK. It's open source. Anybody can contribute to the capabilities of what the the you know the 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 library can can provide. You can extend it. You can uh, add to it your own internal uh, uh, version or flavor of it, and you can continue to pull down uh, new features as they come from upstream in the, in the core projects. Um, uh, but you've you've got your own layer or library you know that, that you've wrapped, and so you can extend and customize. You can basically own the acquisition of the telemetry. Uh, uh, process the the process by which you employ to to build an observable system you should own that outright you shouldn't have to to lease that from somebody you shouldn't lease your telemetry mm. um, uh, at the end of the day because if if you if you if you don't own it you're you're susceptible to to having to take many steps back just because somebody decided that this vendor is no good anymore we're going to go uh, another direction whereas all the vendors that you might use for analysis. Uh, uh, you know, post-production, if you will, right? You know, doing the aggregation and the analytics, everybody should should be supporting the open standards. And if they're not supporting the open standards in a robust way, um, I would suggest maybe looking for, you know, a vendor that does. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you see us, you know, really fully embracing open source and everything that we do or open standards, uh, whether it be metrics, logs, traces, security, we're standardizing, we're driving, you know, common standards because the world is better off when things can communicate and you have open systems interconnect between, uh, you got open standards between. It doesn't, it, you know, it abstracts away clouds, vendors, and everything else. Um, and it really gives you the best of all worlds um, when you're trying to build something that's going to have longevity in terms of process and how you do things uh, in your in your organization. Great. And I think this is our final question for now. But, um, you know, I think some folks may be listening to this and saying, wow, this sounds like a, a lift for my organization. You know, this could be a, a big mm -hmm. culture shift. Um, what are what do you find to be some of the simple, maybe low hanging fruit or simple ways to sort of um, move along toward the process of adopting ODD and becoming a lead performing team? Like what are some simple steps that you think uh, most orgs can take, you know, today or next few months uh, to, to move along? I, th I mean, it depends on what persona, right? Yep. It depends on a persona, I think. Um, I mean, if you're a developer, if you aren't, if you aren't having conversations with other personas in the organization that, that are, consumers of of data business data um your bi teams your data science teams your you know your finance um teams um your sales ops your business operations teams go have those conversations mm -hmm. take them out to lunch like understand what their needs are i think people just need to 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 try to break down silos and communicate um a lot will start to happen when you do that because it really is like you know as a developer i want to be a partner to the business right I don't want to just write great functional software that that does you know great functional things. I want to make sure that I'm uh, you know really also providing all the information that the business needs to be able to make you know decisions about you know how 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 successful it is right. Yep. Um, uh, if I'm also a self service DevOps now, I, you know I'm responsible most likely for the the financial footprint. I'm responsible for how expensive it is for my code to run in production. Uh, so I want to have an agreement on how are we going to measure that? Um, are we going to go to cost per transaction? You know, is, are we, are we, are we, you know, doing cost per customer? Like how much does it cost to provide this feature? And, and does that feature generate, you know, positive cash flow? Um, you know, deciding on how things get measured and standardizing those processes around how things get measured is very, very important. I think you really have to start there. Uh, but, you know, again, I think I, if I were to go all the way back, it really starts with that transformation leadership. 
find the, 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 the agents of change in the organization, come together around, figure out what the needs are for your organization to start moving forward. Um, it's, it's easy enough to just start taking requirements for observability and, and thinking about them up front when you're writing a new mm -hmm. piece of software, thinking about, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a new piece of software, a new microservice or, uh, or whatnot, just think about it up front, bring your security partners along, um, think about what can we automate? How much of this can we automate? How much can we get away? Uh, can we, can we break away and build a team in an organization that's larger than 5,000 employees that might have older standards or ways of doing things, audits, controls, and those sorts of things like financial institutions. Can you break away and create a group inside the organization that can go start doing things straight to production? Um, you know, show that it's successful, show that you can do it in a secure and, and reliable way. Um, then you can start to, you know, kind of cut your teeth on what does that blueprint look like and start taking it and, and bringing more parts of the organization along and, and having them adopt because it is, it is a change of everything and how you do things, right? It's a change in culture. It's a change in process. It's a change in how you measure things. It's being more scientific about how you measure things. Um, and that takes discipline. It takes longevity. It takes, um, uh, you know, consistent application and focus on doing this and, 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 you know, breaking things th uh, up, I think, into, mm -hmm. you know, this is you know, kind of step one, step two, step three, and, and, and really kind of moving along the, 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 that curve of maturity and adoption within the, within the, uh, within the enterprise. Awesome. That was, that was great. Um, I want to thank you both for kind of lending your time to us um, so that our audience could learn more yeah, about this. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, thanks again. Thanks again to Sumo Logic for sponsoring today's webinar. Thank, Thank you, you, SD Times.